Hi everyone, this is AJ with Adventure Co Gaming. This is the Adventure Pod Podcast Episode Four, I believe. Episode Four. Um, we're gonna be talking about all things Monarch pre-release. Super excited to have that. Um, we have a couple new cards to talk about. Um, joining me today, uh, we have Stephen Chang, um, and we have Ryan Fox. And Stephen, what you got going on? Uh, you're coming off a fresh Armory win. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was fantastic. Uh, it was our locals, uh, class constructed, um, probably one of my favorite formats because it's just a little bit more technical. Um, right. So yeah, it was great. Um, took a sweep with Guardian, so it was nice to win out this uh, current meta playing Guardian. It was definitely probably one of my favorite games that I've ever played. So yeah, Thanks. I'm super excited and uh, I'm really excited to talk about some of the new mechanics that they've kind of introduced uh, with these last couple cards that they've kind of um showcased within like the last week or so so yeah yeah pretty excited how you doing ryan excited to have you back on oh yeah i'm excited to be here and i'm excited for this weekend especially we've been waiting long enough after a one week delay in addition to the months we've been waiting so uh yes definitely it's so excited close to tear through, we're so uh, close tear through at least a couple pre-releases that i can attend and uh just see how well my luck goes when it comes to pulling uh Mostly Shadow Brew cards for me. That's what, that's what I'm looking forward to. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So we're going to hop right into it. So first thing we got, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about some new Light Illusionist cards because last week we had just gotten Light Illusionist spoiled. Like literally like an hour before we started recording the podcast, we were just showing Light uh, Illusionist. And then on top of that, we were getting cards like... <laughs> as we were recording the podcast it was a lot of fun so um this time around we do have some cards to talk about so first we have uh arc light sentinel uh, we're going to start right with her prism specialization majestic um arc light sentinel is a yellow pitch it only comes in yellow pitch it uh costs six um like i said prism specialization it's a light illusion illusionist instant uh aura it says, if Arclight Sentinel is in the arena when an opponent announces an attack, they must choose Arclight Sentinel as the target of the attack, and it has Spectra. Spectra means um, Arclight Sentinel can be attacked. When Arclight Sentinel becomes the target of an attack, destroy it and close the combat chain. The attack does not resolve. Let's 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 unpack, before we talk about this card, because it's apparently very good, right? I think this card is insane. It has effectively taunt. Um, let's just real quick before I get you guys uh, uh, to like take on it. Um, I kind of want to just clarify Spectra. So Spectra means that it's an it's an aura, right? So this will stay on the field. Um, to get rid of it, your opponent can attack it. But what happens when they attack it? Um, the attack just kind of like ends, like it just stops, like it just gets rid of this. But the bigger part of that is the attack. If it has one, any haunted effects, and two, if it has go again. Go again is applied at the end of a combat chain. This closes the combat chain before that's allowed to happen. So basically, if they attack this, they're saying their their turn is basically done. Um, as far as like the any action points, unless they were able to cheat other action points. So the reason this is even exists in a really good way is that this kind of has taunt. They have to attack it, and then their turn kind of just ends minus instance or anything extra. So that's kind of how the the mechanics of the card work. Let's get your guys' take on how, like, maybe how good this is. Maybe it's too overcosted. Like, what do you guys think? Um, I think for myself personally, uh, I have played Bravo since I ever got into Flesh and Blood. Right. Um, it is the only class I play. Um, <laughs> uh, despite uh, everyone in our play group telling me to play something different, I've only played <laughs> Bravo. So right. to have a class that not only prevents whatever you're throwing at them. Um, but then a combat chain completely ends is like unbelievably powerful. I think it brings a whole nother dimension of kind of effectively using your resources as far as like your character. And it really makes people think about what they are doing in the turn because, you know, like a lot of these auras, it's an instant. And so this can be cheated in whenever a prism if they have the resources in their hand they can put it in right. whatever so they can like arsenal it and then like if something happens that like let's say as a guardian player i crippling crush them right yeah. um i can 
effectively just fizzle out that entire attack as a prism if I have this card because they're forced to attack over like a brute, right? Like if a brute's setting up and they use a bunch of barraging beatdowns or like you can see that they're ramping up for something, they can cheat this in ahead of time and then just kind of, you know. Right, absolutely. Like, okay. I, I will say, I do think they need to choose the target as they play the Crippling Crush. So I don't think you can flash it in like as the Crippling Crush hits the field. Like uh -huh. if like once okay. they play it. But like if you see yeah. like again, like if you see the towering titan go off and then they go activate Bravo for dominate, and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. You can respond because it's an instant to that. What do you think, Ryan? Oh, How yeah, that's that? true. Yeah, I was gonna say the text very specifically says that it needs to already be in the arena when the attack is declared. So you can see them setting up the turn, like uh Steven said, and at least preemptively throw that out there. Um, but at the same time, you can also just have it set up so that, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? If you think that they're going to pop off with something big during the next turn, and you want to just preemptively see yourself protected from it, or like have any auras or, uh, set up to fizzle out, then this makes for a good way of being like, you know, I'm not going to do it in a surprising way, but I'm basically just going to go ahead and, uh, make sure I'm protected from whatever's about to come. Right. I do think we need clarification on when our targets because like what i just said that that that's how i think it works we don't we don't know exactly because we never had we've never really had i mean we have ult, ultimate pit fight but you kind of choose a player i wonder if like choosing a target is as the attack resolves i'm not sure so i i really do believe that you choose your target as you play the card um so we'll just have to see how that how that really shakes out um as for this card in general i just think you guys both kind of hit it right on the head like i, I think being able to nullify an entire attack is is insane. And not only that, like the other um, illusionist auras that we might talk about, or maybe not, but like the other auras that also provide very good effects, but you can target them as attacks, you can kind of be like, okay, well, I'll do all, if I'm a go again class, a go wide class, I can kind of do all of my stuff and then just kind of throw an attack at the illusion at the end when I'm already like done trying to hit you. Whereas, like, if you're, like, one of these big swing hard classes, like, Brute or Guardian or whatever, and you attack this thing, you have to attack this thing. Or even, I'm sorry, going back to my go wide class uh, argument, let's say you're Ninja, and normally you would go attack, 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 and then throw the last attack, maybe throw a Kadachi at an Aura. Whereas, this is forcing you to spend that first attack on the Aura. And I think that's, and it just shuts down the turn, that just seems so good to me seems so good i wonder if you if you're playing against a ninja you let them swing with the first kadachi and then you drop this as an instant in the middle so it's like okay that's enough for you right, <laughs> like, right, right. i've had enough of your turn you can get that one kadachi and that's it or maybe but, even like basically. let surging strike like hit you they search the whelming or whatever and then oh, like no. in <laughs> response to them searching the whelming you drop the sentinel and you're like you can use it <laughs> but you have to target the, the sentinel so that's yeah. interesting or almost like oh yeah before they get the draw effect or before they get any of the bonuses that normally come right after that that'd be insane yeah just baiting it out because <laughs> then they have to discard a card too to even search it out so they've already lost some of the pressure they have with that or like if you're playing against a dorinthia and they do steel blade supremacy spoils a war and then after they drop those cards in response, you drop this as an instant, so they have to attack it. Oh. <laughs> That's yeah. That's actually crazy. It's like, well, I mean, like, you can go ahead, but... Right, right. And it comes right down to yeah. it. As soon as you see them start setting up, like, maybe chain... Oh, maybe even, like, chain just banished a whole bunch of cards off the top of their deck, and they're about to go in. Oh, my God, he's going to take all the cards. blood debt. <laughs> he'll take all the blood debt he'll have him for next turn sure but oh my gosh he could but like, he's, let's say he's banished seven cards because it's getting to the lord's that late game and mm. he plays one of the buff cards that you see coming just immediately drop down this to have him at least waste one of them but then also whatever he attacks with first regardless of the go again from another soul shackle oh maybe he makes the soul shackle for another one first and then tries to do something it's just this turns over and he takes all that blood debt Oh nothing to mitigate it at all <laughs> so yeah i think i think this card is unbelievably detrimental to setup classes like that anything that has like non-attack right. actions that help set up or buff their upcoming attack you can drop this in as an instant at any moment and that 
completely ruined their day. So I'm so I'm very excited for this uh for this card specifically as a flesh and blood player. I don't know how excited I am as a Bravo player, but um, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's very interesting. For don't sure. worry, you'll be on the chain train when uh, Monarch comes out, right? <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's true. Um, well, actually, you should be more scared then for the reason. Oh, I'm right. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, you're right. It, there, there's nowhere safe. Nowhere no. safe for you when you're playing against the I person just, with this card. Imagine chain with like six soul shackle tokens. They go, I'm going to make a Soul Shackle token, like, to give my next thing go again. And then in response, you go Arc Light Sentinel. And you're just like, go ahead. <laughs> like, you're, whatever your go again is going to be, it has to hit this thing. So, yeah. Oh, oh no. And then the next turn, they just banish all the same things. But they, like, yeah, like, all that stuff, they just banish it as Blood Debt. So, like, against... Like, even Leviah, I mean, I guess Leviah can maybe play around it because she'll banish beforehand, um, like, as part of the cost. But, like, Chain, I feel like this is a big counter to him. Like, because you'll just, they ban it, let's say they have, again, like, six or seven Soul Shackle tokens, they banish seven, and then in response, you play this card, and you just know that if they have, like, five or six of these go-again attacks that all have Blood Debt, but they can only play one, there it is. They just take that blood debt. That's that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, at Ooh. least for Levia, she has the benefit. Like the even the buff cards she has, like convulsions from the bellows of hell or bowels of hell. Um banishes. <laughs> I think you were right the first her. time. <laughs> I think you were right the first time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um it's a very long worded card. We have <laughs> gonna take a while. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. <laughs> um but it banishes as part of the cost. So even if they drop the sentinel right after seeing that to make sure the next attack doesn't get dominates on this uh turn then you'll still get the Sixers in the Banish Zone and activate her ability to protect her from the Blood Debt, at least for the time being. So yeah, You're, you're safe for, like, a turn. A turn. Like, a, a turn. turn. You're, you're safe for, like, a little bit. As um, soon as they drop this, though, you'll still want to throw an attack out at it. So you it have to. Oh, I mean, you have yeah. to. So. You literally have yeah. to. <laughs> All well, right. Actually, no, because technically, I mean, no one should do this in the right mind. But after they drop this, this stays on the field until an attack is declared to destroy it. So on that same turn, even if the buff is wasted, you still want to throw it down or attack with the weapon to just get it out of the way. Yeah. So. Oh yeah, you're not gonna let it stay because like, I mean, you've already burned the buff, right? And then they they activate in response. You're gonna have to like, you're not you're not gonna just be like, well, I guess my buff is wasted. Time to move on. <laughs> like, no, you're gonna still hit it. You'll probably just right. hit it with your weapon instead of whatever attack you were gonna use, but. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. All right, so we're going to move on to the next card. We're going to talk about Herald of Triumph. Um, Herald of Triumph is a light illusionist action attack. Um, it attacks for seven for the red pitch, um, and it defends for three. Uh, it reads, attack action cards have minus one attack while defending Herald of Triumph. If Herald of Triumph hits, put it into your hero's soul. And then, of course, that's Phantasm. So Phantasm says if they defend it with a six or more attack card, um, destroy this card and close the combat chain. Um, kind of the same thing. Uh, any of those effects that require to be on hit, so like um, putting it into your soul, um, all that stuff does not happen if Phantasm is triggered and resolved. Um, this has the benefit of giving those attacks that are defending it minus one attack, so it's le much less likely that they have, they'd have to have a seven attack to trigger Phantasm just naturally on this card. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't I don't know too many cards that really have a seven attack like disable right. for guardian as a blue has a seven. <laughs> um, I was about like, to say your most of your well, guardian cards meant, if you okay, played them in okay, red. Most cards qualify. other than like <laughs> guardian cards, I don't know too many outside of like guardian like brute right. Like, brute has a good handful. That's yeah. Fair. Brute yeah. has a few. It, even in yellow, like Rekoromp qualifies. So even if you use it for the pitch cost, which I will in my brute builds, I'm already anticipating using Rekoromp for its pitch. Yeah. But it blocks as a seven, um, even with the yellow cost. So that it would still, unless they use that other card to go ahead and give it the minus one, would break the phantasm. But let's. Yeah, I. Go ahead. Oh yeah, I I think something that AJ and I have kind of talked about recently is that. What really is the cost of throwing out a card that high to defend, mm -hmm. right? Like as as like a guardian player, right? Like if I don't have disable, like is it really worth it for me to throw out a crippling crush just so I can stop this attack from hitting? Like 
should I like because you know it's like yeah the effects are nice and she gets put into her soul and it hits for seven but you know something that I think people kind of don't think about is that you can still defend this card as a normal attack right right like it it is still a regular attack yeah it has that phantasm mechanic that can kind of like help you in a bind but I think that automatically assuming that Harold is quote unquote weak against guardian or brute classes is kind of a mistake because as a guardian sacrificing a crippling crush in my deck almost isn't worth this hitting because right it's a seven attack right. fine and uh, once again in constructed is a completely different game it's 40 health you the games are much longer um it's more of a game of attrition than it is actually you know swinging like crazy and hoping that you win so i don't know it's i definitely think it's an interesting card the whole it almost kind of guarantees uh, it coming into your soul if they don't defend it like fully, which is kind of nice. But I don't know. I mean, that's a it's... pretty big effect, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say I was kind of worried after all these cards first started dropping with all these like, um, oh, charge your hero soul, or you can do this, this, and this when your hero soul is charged. But when I saw these cards or saw the gameplay uh, footage from the Flesh and Blood channel of the light heroes and how they charge their soul each turn, like. They weren't charging it as often as I thought they would be. And even when they did, they almost immediately, like the turn after, got rid of it. So they right. weren't stacking a bunch of souls. So it, whenever you get a chance to charge a hero's souls, especially since her passive ability, like her um, hero ability, sorry, uh, requires a soul to be banished to even activate. Like, I feel like that actually does have a lot of value in the long game. You would just have to determine whether or not your cards from hand are, you know, worth it to stop it or not. Yeah. I, I also red... think... Oh, what were you going to say? I was just going to say, a red staunch response, like you said, would stop this all the same, blocking right. seven. So. Right. I also think that, like, I feel like having too many cards in your soul is a very big gamble, depending on which class you're playing against as well, right? Because, like, uh, shadow classes get a lot of benefits from being able to rip out cards from your soul. Um, Like, Leviah that we saw has the, her, you know specialization that can like if you have five cards in your soul and she hits with her like specialization it hits you for it takes away a life for everything that you have in your soul but you know i think smart light players will make sure that their soul doesn't get too out of hand just because of the risk that it might pose right. to playing against a shadow player for sure oh yeah as soon as as soon as you started bringing that up all i could think about was soul harvest and how beautiful that would be <laughs> oh i'm sure you do <laughs> oh, Buff it up 12 damage only one needs to hit and i rip a few cards out of their soul for what could have been like a total of like what 16 damage or so with that Inter or i want to say a lot of the the illusionist cards in general they're on hit effects some of them are good some of them are very strong however some of them or a lot of them are either nothing <laughs> or put it into your soul so right. i mean just defending this, like let's say you're your warrior, right? And you defend this with two cards, and you have two cards in hand and a card in arsenal to go into your turn. That's usually a lot of cards for warrior to work with, to be honest. Like especially like now that we're going into a more attack action card based warrior or light warrior, I still think their turn looks very good with that that amount of cards. And they only took one or zero if it was one of the lower phanta uh, uh, illusionist attacks with phantasm. So I just, I don't know. I don't think it's as insane as a lot of people are thinking. And it does have, and I think Phantasm is a very real downside in general. Like, let's say Illusionist becomes very meta. It is one of the easiest classes to meet a tech against. You just throw in a couple generic uh, six attacks that you're not really too worried about. You, like, either throw them out because you can. Like, you throw, like, Cadaver's Contraband. Um, the red is six, right? You throw out the red like you either play it and then you can it has a good on hit effect for you but really it's just a tech to like just destroy all these phantasm attacks mm -hmm. and i think that's maybe that's where we go in the meta i think a lot of people are worried about like this is power creep in some way but i think phantasm is just really that big of a downside that if it ever becomes too much of a problem it's just one of the easiest classes to tech against in that way in my opinion yeah true true and especially when there's uh other ones that even like have six power and uh pitch for yellow so at least you don't lose it in terms of like just using it as a resource in the 
if you happen to draw it when you don't need to defend with it. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. very true. I think something that also is really interesting that kind of goes into our next point is the whole phantasms in general, like the phantasm effect and what that really means. Um, AJ, you're our local judge for mm -hmm. you know multiple stores at this point, so yeah. I think this is definitely your your playground. So please <laughs> educate the masses about priority and what this really means as far as like the changes that uh okay. James White announced. Yeah, absolutely. So in the in the illusionist kind of um uh, announcement article that James White put out, I believe it was James White was the author of it, um, there is a quite large rule change that's been uh that's been put out. I mean it's it's pretty big, uh, I think. So during normal like before we got this article the normal priority windows were um during the action phase um you can either play a card or pass priority when you play an attack that opens a combat chain that in order for that attacks effect to resolve you have to pass priority um so like this would be like if you draw a card on e strike right technically the e strike drawing a card is a layer i pass on it your opponent passes on it i draw the card and then we move to the defense step this is where it gets a little different. Defense step in prior, prior to this article coming out, there was no priority during the defense step. Nothing could happen except for two things. You could either defend with a card, or a card or cards, or equipment, or you could pass. Um, no instance could be played. The reason this is relevant, um, oh, now you can actually, now there is a priority. And the reason this is relevant, um, after you've declared blockers, there is a priority window that opens up during the defense step. Um, what happens now is there's a there's an instant that got spoiled for um, Illusionist that uh, targets a defending attack and minuses his attack by three. Obviously we're talking about Phantasm and you would say like, oh, okay, so I see how that works now. The, the, the instant will target the defending attack and now uh, Phantasm will no longer be valid when it goes to resolve before the end of the defense step. Um, in prior rules, this instant would have been technically useless because what would have happened is that because there's no priority, um, Phantasm would trigger, trigger would resolve during the defense step before any player could do anything, and then we wouldn't even get to the reaction window because according to Phantasm, uh, the combat changes closes and the attack is destroyed. So this becomes a pretty big design space, I think, for them to be able to do a lot of things, like a lot of more combat tricks with instants that we haven't really seen. I mean, there's a lot of reactions, there's a couple instants, but that is the gen general rule change that I hope I explained well. <laughs> um, and that is why I believe, I believe this may have always been that they were going to get to this point. I think for Welcome to Wraith and Arcane Rising format, there was no reason to have it, really. Um, because there's nothing that really interacted with it. So in order to keep the games flowing and keep it simple, um, while the game was still new, they didn't have it. And of course, this is just my theory, but um, as we move into, as the game matures, now we actually have, I mean, it's pretty simple. After every time something happens, you, there's a there's a priority window, basically. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, mostly for the time being, it's only going to... Uh really be important when it comes to uh, illusionist because they want to use it to keep their attacks in the field um i know there might be some sort of like a chit or um effect or uh that's what i'm looking for uh, interaction with the uh needle for ninja right but i think for now the intended purpose and again the intended effects that we'll see most come in or be relevant with is just with the uh, phantasm cards yeah I yeah do it's Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, you go ahead. Okay, I was just going to say, um, the one thing this does is, which is kind of funny, is let's say you defend with a 8-cost attack specifically, and it triggers Phantasm. They play the minus 3 instant, um, and then you play Art of War to buff your cards by 1 again <laughs> in response, and now it still satisfies Phantasm. Which I think is funny. It's a fun like interaction window, but how many times that will actually happen, I have no idea. But I mean, now you think I need to make sure I play it though, because that is an interesting combat trick. 
like more than I was already planning on possibly playing it. But like, oh, that's so funny. I I feel like I need to play it just uh, like a wizard wants to play Aetherize just to see if they get it off once. Oh, I think Aetherize becomes much better in this set. Well, in this, this set, set, okay, I was referring to pre pre monarch sets right, right, where right. Aetherize didn't have much of a purpose minus Sigil of Solace. Um, but yeah, that's actually pretty. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty funny to think about actually yeah it's really interesting to see and i think we kind of noticed this at the beginning of the spoiler season is that the amount of instants that have been yeah. released in the set you know prior to this we've only really had like what like remembrance art of war and the sigils yep and like the there's the guarding cards it's blessing of it's one of the blessing oh, cards. Oh, I know which one you're damage. talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blessing of yeah. Serenity. Serenity, yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah. And then um, there's also the Reinforce the Line from Crucible and a few other odd instants. Uh, Bonehead yeah. Barrier was one, too. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah. yeah. I would love... That would be funny to Aetherize a Bonehead Barrier. Aetherize a Bonehead Barrier, yeah. <laughs> but here. That's, that's like, what's really interesting that's is that, you know... Defense. Yeah, like, we've kind of, like, thought and, like, kind of joked about as, like, a group is that, you know, oh, yeah, it'd be, like, really funny to do X, Y, or Z, but none of them have been really impactful enough for you to say like oh i need to as like a wizard player they probably need to like have at least one aetherize or like two in their sideboard right. but like in this set we've seen a lot of really impactful cards that are instants now and so it's going to be really interesting obviously blinding beam doesn't really do anything for wizard right because they right. don't it doesn't it doesn't help them really but um for like the specializations and like other cards like that um you know the rise of instance and also the level of complexity in the game has kind of increased and right. you know aj i kind of wonder like you know as somebody who is a judge and <laughs> you know see, gets like these kinds of questions all the time like what do you think about the complexity of the game and like the direction and it's going versus like how it has been in the past and do you think that it's going in a better direction or do you think it's like too complicated no so i don't think it's complicated really at all so i think if you've played if you come from a background of TCGs, other than, um, so we can talk about the big three real quick. So you have Magic, Yu-Gi-Oh, and Pokemon. I think, barring Pokemon, because there's no, there is no interaction in Pokemon. Um, if you come from Magic or Yu-Gi-Oh, there's a lot of interactions between each other. And I think Flesh and Blood, early on, um, didn't, it had reactions, right? But the reactions were relatively straightforward and simple it's usually just like plus attack plus an on hit effect minus attack or mi plus defense and some other effect like pretty simple i think instants open the game up so much and really they don't fundamentally change how the game worked in the first place right when i played sigil of solace i still technically had to press priority on that sigil of solace and it had to resolve a lot of times players would shortcut that and just say sigil of solace game three um but of course, once Wizard got Aetherized, and actually, I know it wasn't played too much, but you kind of, if you were playing a Wizard, you had to say Sigil of Solace, kind of with a question mark inflection, right? To like say, like, does this resolve? Um, I think, personally, I really like Instance. I think they open up, so Talents opened up a big design space, right? But I think Instance actually open up way more as we explore that space because they're so fundamental. Like, Talents are these. I, they're not niche as it's kind of what i was going to say but instants are like a fundamental core card like it's a card type that's going to be in a lot of things and i think will some players have to adjust how they understand the game works maybe maybe a little bit but i do think it will lead to a much more interesting game over time and i don't think it's too complicated it still works like fundamental flesh and blood but there's just this added, like, oh, I can be responded to at any time instead of just the combat chain. That's how I feel about it. <laughs> I mean, I feel like the range of cards that can even do anything at instant speed is also consolidated enough to where it's not really complicated. I mean, if you have instant cards that can be played, like, even if you have, like, specific timings or this priority that you guys, like, understand that you keep uh, after you do something... Like, I feel like there's still not a whole lot of complexity to it where it's like, oh, I'm doing, like, except for some wizard tricks. Wizard being, like, maybe the one exception to it because they play 
a bunch of different cards and suddenly give them instant speed. But I feel like it's like pretty straightforward, like you were saying with the sigil. It's like unless it's specifically a wizard, like even if your opponent were to play some sort of instant, like I don't know, art of war for some reason at that point. Like it doesn't fundamentally change that you're at the end of it, you're eventually just gonna gain that three life from the sigil of solace. Right. I mean I so. think that's true now. But I guess the point I was trying to make is that there could be an instant in another class or talent or whatever that says you play Sigil of Solace and then your opponent can respond saying your opponent can't gain life for the turn, right? So it doesn't exist yet. But what, I, what I'm saying is I don't want anyone to feel like alienated or anything. Like, oh, if you don't understand instants, then it's like it's not complicated or whatever. But I just I really think that like if you like once you have a good understanding of how flesh and blood works and really just how the priority window works. I mean, instants are just another layer that you have to pass on for it to resolve. Um, and your opponent gets a chance to respond. I think I think most players, I think all players should be able to get that. I, I just don't think it's that complicated, and I think people will be able to... I have faith in our in our community to to get a handle on instance. I, I think... I think what it really reminds me of... Uh, like, I think it's a very big hallmark of the game itself maturing, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that LSS has done a really good job because, you know, Welcome to Wraith, we're these four classes that I'm not going to say basic because there are a lot of complexities to them, but you know, it's four classes that just run at each other and hit each other with things. Right. Yeah. And then <laughs> I hit then you, with, you hit me. <laughs> I hit like, you, yeah. you hit me. And then we go about our merry way. And then arcade rising added like a complexity with that, with Kano, you know, and just, it kind of brought instance into a bigger space and crucible War expanded on that. But I think with this set, we're really kind of expanding and the game is maturing in a way that I, I find really interesting. It gives me a lot of like the beginning of Yu-Gi-Oh kind of vibes. Cause yeah. like, you know, the first set when like Yu-Gi-Oh came out, um, <laughs> it was like, here are these cards that you can just hit each other, hit each other with. And then, you know, two or three sets in, they started including like the combat chain in like, you know, the like starter books. And it, it used to explain to you like, oh, like, this is what this does. This is what happens when you do like and all you know, that stuff, spell yeah. speed and all that stuff. And they would start introducing that, you know, mechanics that weren't really there. And now they're core staples of the game that nobody even thinks twice about. Right. But, you know, I think Flesh and Blood is kind of going through that same way. And I honestly really appreciate the way that they've done it because it is complicated enough to where it kind of changes. It forces players to change the way that they play and how they build the decks because now you have to think about a lot more things. But it still keeps it very much so within the space of flesh and blood to where it feels natural and it, it doesn't feel completely new because we've already had like some mechanics that have kind of led up to it so um no i i definitely agree with you for sure yeah essentially it makes it so that the game still like instance add a level of complexity to the game but without going off the rails and introducing entirely new concepts along with them like it still feels like it's part of the game that we already know and how to play cards just by reading the text and how they affect the game. But just the timing can be played in more interesting ways, like you said, with the Art of War or the the card that's supposed to be used for the defense step for Phantasm cards. Right. Like it just makes it so that it's pretty easy to understand um, that the card, how the card itself works. It's just that you can play around with the timing to get other effects to trigger in different ways. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of potential for future classes to play around with this in a way that players can still grow to learn and understand, but then maybe like add, add a skill cap to how you uh, specifically right. time it to do different things. Yeah, and I, think I will cool. say that instant that we keep talking about, blinding light. Yeah, that card is terrifying because just just for the record, because we haven't really like talked about it too much. Um, sure. It is a one cost card. Uh, it's just a regular light card, but um it costs one resource less if you play it on a shadow card so if you use a shadow card that's six it's free uh so that card is absolutely terrifying if you're playing against like a shadow if you are a shadow hero because now you're like oh they can tech they can just cast this instance for free if i defend with a shadow card so that is truly terrifying <laughs> and let's not let's not also gloss over the fact that it says oh, i'm just gonna read it since we, we've been talking about it so Real yeah. quick, blinding light, or I'm sorry, blinding beam is oh a, that's what it is. Is yeah. a one cost instant. It says blinding beam costs one less to play if uh, if it targets a shadow card. 
Uh, target attacking or defending attack action card gets minus three attack, and it's a light instant. So one thing I don't, I was gonna say we shouldn't gloss over. You can target an attacking card. It's like a pseudo defense reaction as well. Like Ooh, that's yeah. so good. <laughs> An impromptu block three if uh, you either have the resource to pay for it, or hopefully if it's against a shadow card, you can just be like, oh, I'm just right. defending an extra. What well, also gets around dominate because it's not defending, right? It just minuses it by three. So. Oh yeah, like blessing of serenity, where it just defends attacks, uh, defends extra damage as an instant source. Right. Absolutely. And yeah, I didn't. I didn't think about. I honestly totally forgot about the attacking card part. So <laughs> that's even worse. <laughs> well, probably for because sure. the main main draw to it is for the illusionist to use it to make sure their phantasms don't break. It can right. technically be used as defense, but any generic card can also be used to block three, quote unquote. Yeah. Um, one thing I will ask though. And this is kind of like a weird judge rule. Since we were just talking about like how priority can pass back and forth on something, yeah. can, is the defense step extended? Like, let's say I defend with one card, they use that and pass priority back to me. Can I defend with another card since it's still the defense no. step? No. So the way I understand it, until we get the official article, I'm not like 100% on how that that works exactly. But the way I understand it is you'll assign blockers. Like that part's still sacred. Like you'll you'll assign blockers. And then turn player will receive priority. That's how I understand it. And then you'll pass that priority. And like that's where the instance can be played. But the once the, the blockers can only be assigned one time. Once. That I do okay. know for sure. Um you always assign blockers all at a time and you can only do it once. Man. Like I feel like that's to give the the what's it called prism it's chance to do the tricks with the phantasms and everything but it's like oh can you imagine like just throwing down like a even one of your crush effect cards steven and then just being like them going like nope and then you don't get another chance to like throw down maybe a few more cards and you got no defense reactions oh i mean that's already kind of how like the combat chain works right like you you have to decide on those blocks and then before we even had this change in the defense step you go to the reactions and you're like oh i've already like, I really wish I would have defended with two cards because I didn't know he was going to route the other one. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, true, um, true. Things like that. So It's o- it's almost like a pseudo route where it loses the uh, the ability to defend as much as you wanted to. Uh, but instead of sending the card back to hand, just losing the uh, value it has in destroying the card you're trying to defend. You know, it would be funny as a light class if you played Command and Conquer and they block for six. <laughs> And one of them happened to be a shadow card. You could use this card. Oh wait, no, it's just the attack. Never mind. Right. No, it does. It does not matter. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, speaking of command and conquer with um, Prism, you guys saw Phantasmify, right? Oh yes, we saw Phantasmify. Oh my god. Yeah, just casually pitch a blue Phantasmify command and conquer to have an eleven swinging command and conquer. That. Uh, it has a downside now, though. You made it. Yeah. You made it to where again, now instead of not being able to play defense reactions, like they can just throw a six attack card, and there are six. Like I said, there are six attack cards available to every class because they're generic, like Command and Conquer, which a lot of classes are already playing. So, yeah. you Phantasmify Command and Conquer, and they just throw a Command and Conquer at it. You just burn two cards to their one, and now they're going in with a much bigger hand. So I just no, of course, of course. Yeah, I, I, I understand. Like, there's I think always it's the chance. <laughs> yeah, there's always sure. the chance, of course, of course. But there are still some classes who just just do not play that many. Even like um, what's it called, warrior, sticking to mostly like weapon related buffs and stuff. They play the command and conquers too, of course. But like, well, they're going to be playing celestial strike now or celestial cataclysm. So that's another yeah. three seven damage attacks, and it's seven. So even if you use like the one herald who minuses it by one, it's still six. They like, can still yeah. just throw it at it. So, I think yeah, the I just... game is like so. It's interesting because the meta is about to be blown up. Oh yeah. Because it, I'm very <laughs> yeah. excited for it. It is. It's very clear that the like this set is really going to force a lot of classes to not stay the way that they are at the moment because there's so much more that you have to account for now. You know, for so long we've just had the same eight classes. Some of those classes, um, have fallen a little bit more to the wayside than the others just because of the way that the meta has shaken out but you know 
people are going to have to reconstruct their decks and their strategies based on these new classes. You know, you can't you can't just ignore uh, a Leviathan, right? You can't you can't yeah. you have to make sure you're accounting for that. You can't ignore a prism because you know you can go into a tournament and a prism if you don't have what you need, a prism can just blow you up. Oh yeah, right. So you know it's going to be really interesting to see what happens to the meta with you know these all of these classes accounting for the new classes and it'll also be really interesting to see what old classes kind of get a buff because the current meta classes are forced to accommodate for you know the new meta so you know i know ryan you were a big ranger proponent so who knows this this may be your yeah maybe maybe it does actually turn out like sleep dart to levia could literally mean like death (laughs) like I mean, unironically, not just the sleep dart, but just a few of those uh, generic cards in the class that just kind of synchronize with Ranger trying to dominate arrows. You know, it helps. Every little bit helps. Yeah. And uh, I'm excited to see how much they affect them. Not again. And Ranger's (laughs) rise. I don't know if they ever rose in the first place, but hopefully, I'm sure they'll get their chance. And especially when we get to the pits and maybe some other talents, we'll have Ranger cards and stuff too. So I'm Um, looking forward to seeing if they give Ranger a chance to get. the light slash shadow treatments or talent treatment like these classes have. It'd be interesting to see. And I definitely agree with Steven that this is definitely going to shake up the meta. I'm excited for that most of all, because for the most part, we see mostly uh, mech, warrior, and uh, a bit of ninja kind of like topping the tables in a lot of tournaments. Mm-hmm. Um, but now we might have a case where the room blades, uh, brutes, or even this new illusionist class suddenly take the top tables and start changing how the meta needs to be prepared for right like deck building just won't be the same for a while after this until we start getting used to how we interact specifically with the light and shadow classes and then possibly even just the buffs to the older classes that get a few new cards to play with right and i think i think the delay and not the delay of monarch as like how it was delayed or whatever i think just the 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 time in between crucible of war and or let's actually even before that the time between arcane rising and the time between monarchs so between the two core sets was i'm pretty sure it was over a year right because we're getting this at the end of april and yeah. monarch or i'm sorry arcane rising came out in february pre-release march. was in february march yeah. time so anyway the point is between two core sets we have a year of the same meta now of course we got crucible war which supplemented a lot of those classes and then changed some things but really it just made a lot of classes stronger but it it kind of rose the tide for all ships right so we kind of had these classes that were kind of predominant in the meta for so long i mean it's been over a year of just warriors really good mechanologist is really good um ranger needs some help like things were we just things that were established right (laughs) yeah things that were established where i just finally we have a new core set to just Say, you know all those things you know? Well, now you're going to have to refigure it out, right? Now you're really going to have to. These are, we have talents, which kind of are like pseudo new classes. And then we have a true new class who works differently than every other class. And even the classes you think you know, like Warrior is playing way more, like Light Warrior is playing way more attack actions than Dorinthia ever dreamed of, <laughs> like before. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And then uh, the Runeblade card, or Runeblade, uh hero chain the shadow rune blade is not worried about rune chants at all like i mean very little i mean i'm sure through the already established uh rune blade card pool i'm sure he'll make a couple <laughs> but it's not like how viscerai was totally reliant on rune chants it's gonna it's just very different and i'm i'm all for it I mean, one of the fun things that even in that example, like Chain can do, he can still use generic Runeblade cards, like read the runes to create a few, using his ability to give it go again, and then he has a higher chance to deal arcane damage to give all of his other triggers on his cards that he's going to play from the blood debt their bonus effects, or even right. consuming volition to give it its bonus effect. Bonus effect. There's so much potential to play around with some of the old cards and the new classes with their um, shadow variants that there's no telling what exactly the meta is going to play out with until like even like maybe even two to three months out after people have had enough time to experiment with them. Absolutely. So 
what do you guys think your favorite cards are in the set so far? Like, because go obviously first, you've Ryan. gotten a lot. Yeah, Ryan, I want to know. Is your favorite I want to know. Uh, it's a hard toss up between a few of the Levia slash Shadow cards, but like I'll have to say my favorite one just in concept for what the potential technically has to be up there is Soul Harvest. I hate that it's limited to one, but I also understand why it's limited to one. That's the one if where I... she's punching the the chick into the wall, right, and like ripping out her chest. Is that that one? Yeah, it's so yeah, good. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Literally being able to self buff itself to twelve damage. Sure, you have to pitch six, sure, but like that's fine. Two blue cards and you're good to go. The fact that you can self buff it to up to six damage, and then if you have other cards that you could have played that turn from either your blood debt pile or even from your hands, like the um, convulsions from the Bellows of Hell, like giving it dominates for 15 potential damage on its own, and then also the bonus damage from ripping out their souls, like. It's in such an insane either game closer or a tempo swing. And yeah. there's, it just looks insane too with its artwork and everything. And it feels like it embodies Levia's person, like Levia's character, the style that she's playing as the most out of all the other cards that have been shown. Funny enough, it's not technically a root card, which is the weirdest part, but it's. I it's think a it's Levia only card. like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a Leviathan card, and I'll be honest, just as a side note, I think they made it so it's not brute specifically, so it can get buffed by brute specific cards with intimidates. Which, oh, thank God for oh. the opponents. Oh, if it had I didn't, even think, I didn't that. think about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. oh my God. If it, it had like double beat down right, to really. worry about, or blood rush bellows or something to worry about, that'd be that'd be too much to handle. Like the amount of damage ramping you could get potentially get on that card would be insane. Or tear limb from limb getting the buff from mm. that somehow and then doubling its base damage just with the uh extra banish cost it'd be impossible for a light warrior to or a light um uh, light character to even defend against it if the brute had time to set it up look at lss but they think of everything <laughs> i know brilliant <laughs> it was a good idea um definitely my favorite card from the set i do also like the uh demon ally mechanic uh it sucks that it's only limited to one as well so you only get one chance to get it out as far as we know there's no way to shuffle back instance yet but if there is then i'm sure prism would love that most of all um and then other than that i think my last if i had to talk about top threes like that <laughs> the demon allies and then the last one would probably have to be the couple of new brute cards i have to play with right are now like, Tear Limb from Limb is insane. I like Hulk Swing with insane. Big Tree, or whatever and it is. Swing with Big Tree! Let's go! <laughs> Can you okay. imagine? How is that only a 7 damage card? I feel like just on physical trauma alone, that thing should be at least 9. Like, you're getting hit with a big-ass log. How the hell are you recovering from that? Especially if you're Prism of all things. I feel like your body is literally just going to be thrown up against the rocks and just millions of pieces right there. i'm i'm not the no biggest way. fan of brute but i hope there's a brute in every set because they always have the best card names <laughs> like swing fist they have the best later, card names. arc smash like swing with big tree <laughs> like it's amazing <laughs> oh, they have such like they play them off as this such a devastatingly ruthless like not even just like class but just like the race of brutes like um they're just shown as being so devastatingly brutal and uncaring to anything that is not like their own kind. And then you get those cards where it's like, they're smart enough to say words, I guess, but like, <laughs> they're just not, not, not like quite there with being eloquence. They, they have their own eloquence, you could say. I think that's what makes Leviah so terrifying, right? And it's like interesting because if you like read her lore, you know, she was like brought up in nobility. You know, she's like this, you know, pretty much orphan almost and she has literally just lost it at this point like she has gone fully mental <laughs> and she is exists to do nothing more than just literally just devastate everything around her yeah. so like i think the flavor like for her entire story is just really amazing for all sure. the all the story is so good and that that brings me to my favorite card so <laughs> so so I read the story for Prism, and already Prism was spoiled, and I was like, my favorite card's Prism. Just the hero in general. <laughs> like, 
but reading her story and like when you get to the end and i believe it's like they're being attacked supposedly from the monastery like shadows are overcoming the walls and blah, blah blah and then in order to inspire her people she summons all the heralds and like the people like rally behind that and i was like and then they started spoiling the heralds like in in the game or like as the cards that are coming out and just all the heralds are my favorite i love the flavor of that and i love i think they're all good and they're all like really cool looking and just oh i'm so excited to play prison <laughs> that's definitely my favorite um i think the foils for the heralds are going to be so cool money her her money. cards <laughs> so red. her cards are just so beautiful so and pretty. like the foil they're like the artwork on there is just absolutely interesting like all the heralds i think the three other ones that are spectra not the sentinel but like ones like the let me see it's like parable Genesis. of humility merciful retribution and ode to wrath the art style of those are very different it's like a cartoon kind of like um like a renaissance type you know artwork and like the foils on all of these cards for illusionists are just going to be absolutely amazing so yeah i i definitely agree with you i think for me I'm not sure. Um, I I am really waiting to see what these generics are like because at this point in time we still haven't gotten a good chunk of generics and you know especially in these past sets generics have really kind of boosted decks in ways yeah. that we didn't really expect. For example, like E Strike. Like you will be hard pressed to find anybody who doesn't say E Strike is great, right? I don't think anybody will say that because it's it's so impactful. It's a generic any class can play it in. Like you know, it's seen a lot of decks, and, like, you know, my personal favorite as a Guardian, Command and Conquer, right? And it's just such a good card that is so impactful, and it's so cheap as a generic, and so I'm really holding out to see what these generics are, even the ones that we, for as far as, like, the ones that, that have come out, I think cards like Surging Militia are really interesting, um, especially as a draft card, um, just because it kind of forces people to block if they don't want to uh if they don't want damage to get through which is kind of really interesting and i feel like cards like that have really added a layer as far as like the mechanics and gameplay that um i feel like really go along with the set um same thing like the card that bronson had as a spoiler the rally the rear guard which you know as an instant you can discard a card and it gains defense you know once again we see like this whole instant narrative play within monarch as far as like what that looks like and how that affects um you right. know gameplay so i am very excited for those cards i think i will say um <laughs> my my favorite card however so far is uh yinti yanti <laughs> okay okay <laughs> i i think it's hilarious um i i'm very i'm very confused as to why it exists yeah. Um, I think it is definitely, as much as I hate to admit it personally, a draft card. Um, you know, it's kind of one of those things where you just kind of throw in there. But um, it is interesting, the amount of aura interaction. And I think that's kind of like why I like it so much is, you know, before this set, the amount of auras that were in the game were really limited. You know, like Guardian had an yeah. aura. Um I can't think of what else, or, or it's like, is uh, Zen State, is that an aura? Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and so, like, the amount of auras that were in the game prior to this were, like, really small, and so to see more, quote-unquote, like, aura interaction be in cards is really interesting for me. Um, maybe there's a world where this card will just win you games. Um, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> it would be very dependent on, like, being able to manipulate the attack in some way because if we're being serious here like yanti yanti is a worse wounded wounding blow wounding blow wounding blow is a zero cost for attack with three defense which yeah. is like what yanti yanti gets to and it has to like work to get there so there has yeah, to be but... like 
I think it would have been better if Yinti Yanti gained the effect for each aura. Oh, like you could thing. argue, <laughs> you could argue. Look, well, hang on. There's not too many. Or oh wait, no, Rune Blade would be. Insane. I was just saying, Holy Chain crap. makes a hundred. Oh like, yeah. No, no, not Chain. Uh, Viscerai. Uh, that too. Oh, that too. and the chains. Oh my gosh, yeah. the chains and Soul Shackle. Oh, yeah, the Soul Shackle. Eat Soul Shackle. That'd be Soul, amazing. Just hit for like oh my gosh. fourteen on turn for like zero seven or whatever. Oh <laughs> like, yeah. All right, you're right. Well, maybe they can put a cap. Like, this can gain up to plus three for each aura that uh, is in the air, aura arena or something. But um, I, I will say... I can't as believe much as I, I almost want broke this, the game. Yeah, I, <laughs> um, I will say, as much as I love this card, uh, I, I think I love it more for the interaction that it kind of brings into the game right. versus, like, its actual actual use with What it can mean in the stats. future. Right. Yeah. 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 Will I play one? Just for fun. <laughs> Please win a game. Please win a game off of Yinti Anti. I would be so happy. <laughs> Yinti Anti for game. I wish, um, I wish, even if they didn't want to give it more attack, I wish it started with three defense or something. And then yeah. it went to four. I think that would be You really can cool razor it. Space. You can razor a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A lot of better things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you guys. Don't don't count the yinty yanti out, you know. On that uh, note, <laughs> I, I'm waiting for you to prove us wrong, Stephen. <laughs> on that note, let's let's just finish up with a uh, pre-release. Pre-release is right around the corner. Hmm. What are you guys going going on for pre-release? What what do you hope you are able to build? What do you think is going on? Like, what do you guys have? Like, what's just, what's just on your mind for pre-release? Uh, of course, I'm down for the spirit of playing with what optimal card or what i get and yeah. trying to make the most optimal deck off of what i like if i get more prism cards or warrior cards just light cards in general or even majestics or legendaries in those classes i'm of course going to build that i hope i can start knocking out my checklist of cards on for levia to you know get that train rolling and then also start playing it in the uh what's it called sealed format because i feel like levia especially like has a lot of commons and generics that can be used more effectively in that format or to a greater effect because it's all about just frontline damage without needing a bunch of combo cards or like setup mm -hmm. and in a 20 health pool that's pretty devastating so yeah. hope to get it for not only the win but also getting my cards in my collection but i'm definitely excited to just try any of these new classes especially like Rune Blade, Levia, and even the uh, new Illusionist class to see how it feels to play, rather than just like theory craft. Um, I will say I am at a toss up between Chain and Prism. Mm -hmm. Um, I think Chain is very interesting, and um, watching that game that they that uh, Alice has put yeah. out on their YouTube channel was very very interesting. Watching that game and uh. Truly terrifying as to how many soul shackle tokens yeah. he made. Like it, that blew my mind. I was, he was, I think it was like up to like six or seven it in that video. Seven, yeah. It was a lot. And like that last game that he uh, like swung return, he had no more cards to draw. Yeah, he either like, wins there or does not win at all. Like <laughs> right. So um, that's really interesting to me. Um, the only thing that terrifies me is is that I think dying from blood debt is a if it wasn't already a real enough reality in the game in general, as far as the mechanic is concerned, if there is ever a format where you have a higher chance of dying from blood debt, it is this. Right. And so <laughs> that's I mean, even taking two blood debt is your is ten percent of your life, right? Correct. Like, for free right. to your opponent, like. Yeah. So that's, crazy. Um, that's like kind of interesting to me. So chain, but I also am really interested in Prism just because it's the new class and she's very flashy shiny so new uh, <laughs> shiny new things i'm all for so those are the two that i'm kind of uh gunning for but if i if i have to play something else because that's what i get in my draft packs then so be it <laughs> yeah i'm definitely on board with that it, it's gonna be like i i'm going to the pre-release on sunday at our local store at the collective um represent <laughs> um yeah sure. and uh i i hope to pull a lot of prism cards and play prism in the pre-release just because i really want to play prism in general but yeah of course we're gonna build whatever whatever the packs deem worthy <laughs> um absolutely awesome yeah awesome. it's just gonna feel it's just after all this time and waiting again i'm gonna reiterate this is just gonna feel so refreshing oh it's 
shiny new things not just prism but everything shiny new we're like 48 shiny. hours away like we're so hours. close so oh, to the first free release all right and with oh. that i'm gonna thank you guys for joining me uh once again it was uh i am aj i was joined by steven and ryan this has been adventure company gaming thanks for listening um if you haven't already remember to like and subscribe uh we're gonna be putting out a lot of this content um, a lot more gameplay content coming up and we're gonna try to be getting the pre-release um either stream to you or at least a video of it a vlog or something we're definitely going to bring you some pre-release content as well um and uh definitely when we get our uh our actual orders of monarch look out we don't do box openings on this channel very often but at least for when sets come out we're going to be having a huge box opening um pretty much everyone in here in this podcast is going to be opening <laughs> a lot of product of first edition monarch it's gonna be a lot of fun and um from there we're gonna have a lot of uh a lot of strategy videos and a lot of conversations about that stuff and a lot of gameplay and uh so thanks again for joining us and we'll hope to see you next time have a catch good one. you later <laughs>